So fertility is uh, that capacity the soil has to, su to supply nutrients in uh, adequate amount uh, without uh, toxic uh, substances. So basically when the soil is highly productive, we actually know that it is, it is fertile. But generally a fertile soil may not be uh, always highly productive because of environmental conditions, uh, either uh, diseases or uh, supply of water. Because the availability of water is very, very important, especially to allow uh, movement of nutrients and uptake by the plant. So uh, application of water through irrigation is one of the means of improving uh, the fertility and the productivity of the soil. So, as I said, we, we have those essential elements, uh, that is carbonate, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and a number of macronutrients which are required in big quantities, but also the mic micronutrients which are required in small quantities, but we also have the non-essential, uh, which are really required very, very minimum quantities. Soil fertility uh, can be lost, and uh, you lose it in, in several ways. Uh, we lose it uh, through harvest of, of crops. Uh, we lose it uh, the way we manage the weeds. Uh, we lose it through erosion. Uh, we can also lose it through the way the tillage is done. So uh, basically, when we grow plants, uh, these plants need these, these nutrients, so they mine some of these uh, nutrients from the soil and they take them in their biomass. So once we remove the biomass and we take away from the garden, we basically also lose uh, the nutrients uh, from, from these soils. Uh, and soils being uh, more of friction systems, uh, if you have lost two kilograms of nitrogen, you may need more than that to actually put back the two kilograms of nitrogen. Uh, in terms of weeds, uh, weeds and crops are generally are, are in competition. And especially when the nutrient levels are very low. Uh, the competition for this scarce nutrient now becomes very stiff. Uh, and in some time, uh, the weeds uh, grow faster and they starve the crop. So uh, if you remove the weeds uh, without leaving them rot uh, on, in the soil, on the soil, then uh, you don't put back the nutrients. And that will be one way of losing the nutrients. Erosion, uh, of course, we know erosion is very selective and is basically target the finest particles uh, in soil. And those finest particles have the highest uh, uh, particle uh, density or surface area. And uh, the fact that they have the highest surface area, it actually means those particles have the highest interaction with uh, the nutrients. So uh, the highest concentration of nutrients. So if those particles are removed, then uh, certainly you are losing a big amount of uh, uh, the nutrients. And in most, in most, uh, our soil, most of our soils, uh, erosion is rampant and generally uh, beyond the tolerable uh, values. Uh, meaning that uh, with time, we actually lose uh, very fast the status uh, of uh, uh, the fertility.
partie des corporations. Nutrient can also be lost through uh, leaching, and particularly those ones which are, can be dissolved into water, especially uh, nitrogen. Uh, through erosion, we lose more phosphorus because of uh, the bound between phosphorus and uh, uh, the soil particles. But uh, through leaching, we make actually lose a lot of nitrogen because of it, it is, can be dissolved easily in, into the soil. But we also have cases where uh, nitrogen can actually be lost in gaseous form, uh, especially when uh, you have those uh, conversion uh, from one form uh, to another. So, generally, soil fertility uh, depends on several things. Uh, and here, um, I'm basically looking at uh, four uh, different elements here. One is the soil type. Different soil, different so soil types have different inherent uh, fertility because of the nutrient they have, because of their characteristics, both uh, let's say physical, biological, and the chemical uh, uh, content, but also the issue of drainage, the issue of texture, the issue of uh, 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 topography, which is linked to water availability, uh, the issue of the depth of the soil, all those will actually affect in one way or the other uh, the inherent or potential uh, and even uh, uh, productivity at a particular time. The other factor we need to consider here is the way the land is managed. Certainly, uh, poor management will actually contribute to uh, reduce uh, uh, crop uh, yield, uh, but we also have pests and diseases. Uh, uh, these pests uh, which are rampant in, in most of our uh, gardens, uh, contribute to the loss of productivity. And the, the other factor which is also very important is uh, the climate. Uh, here you look at all the different parameters of climate, uh, solar radiation, uh, rainfall, uh, temperature, all and relative humidity are very important in actually uh, uh, either uh, uh, maintaining the water level or uh, losing the water through evapotranspiration. Uh, but at ecosystem level, uh, we, we need to look at productivity in it with, with a different eye. And, and this case here is... Uh, one of the indicators of productivity is what is above uh, the ground. So uh, it's, it's basically uh, the biomass, the quantity of biomass uh, which we get on top of the soil. Uh, and this is uh, a function of uh, the energy budget. Uh, uh, the amount of energy uh, the net energy which is actually received by the ecosystem and which is converted into, into biomass. So, uh, for every ecosystem, we actually, we can actually define the net primary productivity or the net product, uh, primary production, which is actually the the global primary production uh, minus the energy used by primary producers for respiration. So, NPP is uh, in terms of uh, biomass per unit area per, per year. So, at a given time, the NPP is basically the amount of new biomass which is added uh, during that time. 
And we need to note that the, only the NPP is available to consumers. Uh, ecosystem vary greatly in NPP across uh, the earth. So, how do we estimate soil productivity? Uh, there are different methods. Uh, there are those direct methods, but we also have indirect uh, methods. So the direct methods uh, can be done in the field, uh, can be done uh, in greenhouses. Uh, we can do uh, evaluation using in, in the lab uh, uh, using some form of experiment uh, under given climatic and management conditions. But the indirect methods uh, also exist and we can actually use uh, a number of models which have been developed uh, across the world uh, to make an estimate of soil productivity. And uh, for this case, uh, we, we opted to actually use uh, existing models. Uh, there are a number of models which have been developed in the 70s and which have been, have been improved over time. And here I'm thinking about the modified uh, soil productivity index and uh, the land productivity index. So the modified uh, soil productivity index is basically the product or the different factor rating. Okay, so uh, I was uh, st uh, starting uh, discussing the, uh, the estimation of soil productivity. And as I say, uh, we uh, basically used uh, the existing models uh, and that's what I'm going to discuss now. So we are looking at uh, the models which are developed in the 70s uh, and the beginning of uh, the 80s. And that is uh, the modified soil productivity index and the land productivity index. Uh, one is expressed as a product of the factor rating uh, of productivity indicators. And the other one is expressed as the square root of factor rating, the square root of the product of factor rating uh, used in productivity estimation or productivity indicator. So uh, there are several uh, parameters which are used in those models and that is cation exchange capacity, uh, soil depth, base saturation, the organic matter, slope, uh, texture, drainage, gravel. And there are a number of parameters uh, which can be put in the estimation. And uh, for each of those parameters, uh, they have uh, factor rating. So we actually use uh, a number of those parameters and uh, the proposed uh, factor rating in the model. That is for soil productivity. On the other side, uh, we have to look at uh, vegetative biomass, the amount of biomass uh, generated uh, by a crop. So uh, there are different ways also of making an estimation of it. 
the first uh, approach could be to use uh, allometry or allometric equation to uh, estimate how much biomass uh, is actually standing and uh, below the ground. Uh, generally, uh, uh, the allometric equation known uh, are using uh, power functions or log functions. And basically those are the anti, uh, the, uh, once you want to transform, to transform the power function, uh, you can get some kind of linear function using log. Uh, several of these models have been developed across the world and uh, for different regions. And they use uh, plant characteristics such as uh, the DBH or the height uh, to determine uh, value. The second uh, approach is uh, the multi scale estimation. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, measurements are done at a small scale and then extrapolation is done as uh, the scale uh, increases. I just give an example. Uh, if, if you have you have done some measurement on plot level, and maybe a forty by fifty or fifty by fifty meter uh, plot, and you have gone and measured height and DBH for those plots, and you want to now extrapolate uh, beyond uh, a hectare and uh, uh, for the entire ecosystem. In that case, you may actually need to develop. An allometric equation. Yeah, I was discussing the uh, the different uh, approach approaches to estimate vegetative uh, uh, biomass, and I would say uh, measurement can be done at a small scale and uh, extrapolate it to a larger scale. Of course, if you have done on a fifty by fifty meter. Uh, plot and you want to eat for a, a hill slope or uh, a catchment level, then you need uh, uh, to have some uh, uh, allometric equation done and uh, of course some earth observation information on uh, either uh, the biomass, not either the, uh, the uh, DBH or the height of uh, uh, the trees at that scale. So uh, the accuracy of the model is again off. So uh, the accuracy of the model will depend on uh, the data which has been collected uh, at plot level. But of course, the estimation at a larger scale will also depend on the accuracy of the, of the model, but also uh, the size of the area where you want to make an extrapolation. So uh, this raises, of course, the issue of uh, representation of the plot uh, uh, before uh, the extrapolation is done. If, if, at the plot, uh, used in estimation of the uh, development of the allometric equation representative of the area uh, where the estimation is going to be uh, done. So basically you find that uh, the error propagates across scale. So, and, and that's why uh, accurate measurement should actually be done at, at the source. But we can also use uh, geostatistics, and geostatistics has turned out to be one of the uh, uh, important tools, uh, especially for uh, regional variables. Uh, regional variables standing for variables uh, which uh, 
change with position. And, and this will not require too much of uh, uh, a distribution function as uh, classical statistics uh, will need. Uh, of course, uh, limitation uh, of your statistics are known, and uh, uh, the user of your statistics should be aware of it and, and make sure that uh, some of those limitations are actually uh, taken care of uh, and before they are used for estimation of variables. Uh, the other approach is basically remote sensing. So, uh, uh, vegetation uh, is easily, or let's say, the, the indicators of vegetation uh, in remote sensing uh, are known, and uh, one of them being uh, the normalized uh, difference vegetation index. And, and this can be computed uh, from each of the, sat the different satellite uh, uh, sources, data we have. Um, and uh, the good thing that uh, uh, some of these images are now available and uh, accessible by most of us. Of course, each of these approaches has its own limitation and strength. Uh, of course, if uh, we do the observation, the direct observations, uh, then we, we, we minimize we minimize uh, 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 we minimize the error. But again, this depends on the tool we have. Uh, we, we can't and uh, the area we want to cover. Uh, we, we are very limited uh, in actually uh, moving in space uh, if, we, if we have to use our, our legs to actually carry and uh, uh, get the information. Sometimes uh, this information is required in a short period of time. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, you really need uh, 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 remote sensing and all other art observation systems to actually collect uh, some of this information. Uh, of course, the issue of geostatistics is known. Uh, as I said before, uh, uh, different models uh, will produce uh, different values. But again, the way the data is collected and the requirement of the data uh, is also uh, very important. On the side of uh, remote sensing and other uh, uh, tools, of course, uh, the resolution uh, is also uh, very, very uh, crucial. Uh, as I say, the normalized difference vegetation index is the most uh, important indicator for, for vegetation. And as we know, it is uh, computed uh, uh, based on the red uh, window and uh, the near infrared uh, uh, bands. Uh, and this uh, is uh, one of uh, uh, the polarization index uh, uh, used in, uh, in simple physics. Uh, where uh, the NDVI is the near infrared uh, minus the red over the sum of the, uh, both uh, infrared, near infrared and, uh, and the red. This fraction ranges between minus one and one. Uh, and, and we know the higher the value of uh, the NDVI uh, the more um, it indicates uh, the presence of vegetation. So uh, different models have been developed across the world uh, to test uh, uh, 
NDVI and the biomass. Uh, so some of these are, are linear functions, uh, others are logarithmic, of course, uh, uh, quasi -linear, linear functions, uh, exponential, which are also once transformed uh, linear functions. And uh, the NDVI and biomass have been strongly related or strongly correlated. And, and this is very, very important uh, uh, information to actually show that uh, there is uh, some good relationship between the NDVI and, uh, and the biomass. Of course, uh, there are cases, uh, for example, where uh, the vegetation has grown and uh, the NDVI uh, start going down, uh, but where, why uh, the biomass uh, almost, remain, almost remain constant. Uh, but uh, those are uh, uh, fewer cases uh, when, when the, the, or the forest or the trees are reached uh, maturity. But generally, there is a very strong relationship between biomass and uh, the normalized different vegetation limits. Now, uh, for, for this case, af uh, of course, after the, this introduction on what on uh, the concept of uh, uh, fertility and productivity and uh, assessment of land productivity, uh, we went ahead to uh, test some existing model based on the information available. So we collected a number of information uh, on land use, land cover, uh, uh, digital elevation models, uh, soil data, uh, climate data, but also uh, uh, some uh, satellite images, uh, and but also the protected, protected areas. Um, so this data set uh, was important uh, to try to evaluate the different existing models and uh, see uh, which model could actually be used uh, or which type of adjustment could actually be used to or done to make sure that we, uh, we can assess uh, uh, productivity uh, of the land in terms of soil productivity, but also above ground uh, productivity. So uh, this is uh, a sketch of uh, our conceptual uh, uh, model and uh, the way uh, the different uh, uh, models were generated. Uh, OK. So. Uh, our uh, conceptual model is uh, uh, the one I've presented there. And this model basically consider, uh, uh, if you look at on the left, two basic models, above ground productivity index, but also the soil productivity index. Uh, I'll come back to this. Uh, it was assumed that uh, the two could have actually conferred to us a land productivity model. But uh, if you look at the above ground productivity, uh, we are looking at the NDVI as an indicator of the biomass, but also uh, rainfall as uh, uh, somehow also associated with uh, the productivity of biomass, but also the land use. So uh, the first thing was basically to make sure that the NDVI was detrended to remove the effect of rain, rainfall, but also uh, 
the rainfall was used to make an estimation of erosion. So once the, rain, the NDVI was detrended from the rainfall, we actually had uh, uh, something we could use uh, to, uh, to use to actually develop above ground productivity index using uh, normal statistics, classical statistics. Now, uh, for uh, the soil productivity, the soil productivity was uh, developed based on fertility potential of the soil, but uh, we also took into consideration the, uh, the section of erosion. Uh, erosion, uh, which is linked to a number of factors, uh, rainfall with its erosivity, uh, land use cover with a C factor, uh, soil with its readability, but also the slope, uh, which generates for us the slope length factor. So if you combine the four factors, erosivity, uh, C factor, erodibility, but also the slope length factor, then you have the potential soil loss. And this potential soil loss was added on the soil productivity index, which was generated uh, based on the existing models and the fertility potential to have an idea of the actual uh, productivity of uh, the given soil. Uh, of course, consideration was also done on uh, uh, the environment, uh, basically uh, the human factor, uh, looking at uh, population density, but also uh, 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 the existing uh, cities, because uh, anyway, both population in cities, uh, cities where we have cities, that's where you expect to have um, a, a bit of uh, high concentration of uh, human beings. So uh, that information was supposed to be linked to uh, the land productivity model. Uh, basically after uh, the two major indices were fusion to give an average indication of what could be the productivity. But uh, I'll come back to this as, uh, uh, as we move. So uh, the soil productivity index uh, was uh, defined uh, based on the FAO soil classification. Uh, but also uh, we uh, used uh, the model, uh, the best model to actually also infer based on the properties of the soil, what was uh, uh, the productivity for that particular soil. So, uh, basically, everything was based on the two uh, uh, models, as I said, which were generated between the 70s and 80s. The modified soil productivity index, land productivity index, but we also uh, tried to uh, modify some of these models to bring in some kind of clustering or productivity, but also uh, try to look at what the mean uh, factor rating could actually give in terms of uh, productivity index. So uh, this is an example of the modified soil productivity index where we have the product of the factor rating, then uh, the land productivity index, which was the square root uh, of uh, the product of the factor rating, and then the way we define a cluster productivity being a sum of the different factor rating uh, normalized uh, based on the minimum value uh, and the maximum values of uh, uh, factors we had obtained. And what we had called the mean soil productivity index, which was actually giving us 
uh, which was computed as the sum of the mean of uh, uh, the different factor rating. So uh, what we use for uh, uh, available properties were basically the cation exchange capacity, the soil depth, uh, base saturation and pH, organic matter, slope, texture and drainage. So we had uh, in total seven uh, uh, factors used in this uh, estimation. So, so the soil productivity uh, was uh, standardized and then we reclassified it using the fact FAO uh, factor rating scheme, uh, which uh, showed that uh, less than 20 was very low productivity, 30 low productivity, uh, less than 50 moderate, high uh, productivity was less than 75 and above 75 was categorized as high, very high uh, productivity. So um, we, we try to compute uh, the accuracy of our model based on uh, uh, the classification from uh, the FAO. And what we actually observe, uh, if you can look at it, so the land productivity index uh, gave us uh, the highest uh, relative accuracy um, and the overall uh, relatively low errors of omissions, but also uh, uh, fairly uh, comparable uh, errors of commission with other models, but the strength was basically the accuracy and uh, the error of omission. So we also, as I said, estimated uh, soil loss uh, using, uh, since this was done for East Africa, and, and uh, we use uh, more equation for uh, erosivity, more uh, used uh, different uh, precipitation values and uh, demonstrated that the erosivity could actually be used, generated based on uh, rainfall. And uh, uh, that's the equation he developed uh, for erosivity uh, under the revised universal soil loss equation. So uh, we for erodibility, for us to estimate erodibility, we basically used uh, values uh, proposed by Morgan in, in uh, his publication in 1995, uh, based on texture and organic matter. So we also use uh, more et al. Uh, 1991 to uh, determine the slope length uh, in, in QGIS. And uh, the C factors, we uh, borrowed the values from Panago Cetal uh, 2015. Uh, some of these values of Panago, though uh, developed for Europe, uh, were very, very comparable uh, to values uh, which have been used in different models in, in East Africa. So uh, those were these different values. Uh, and if you look at them uh, with what is known for East Africa, certainly you will see a very good uh, correspondence with uh, uh, what is used in most of our publications. So then we use uh, the AFO 1990 to make a classification of the uh, soil loss um, uh, from very low uh, to very high, um, taking 0 point, less than two tons per hectare per year being very low and above 90 tons per hectare per year as very high. One of the other thing also which was uh, 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 considered here is uh, the annual nutrient input because this 
is very important in uh, defining the acquired fertility. So uh, it was necessary that we actually see what is actually going on in terms of nutrient input to see if uh, 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 somehow uh, these additional uh, nutrients could actually affect uh, uh, the actual uh, observed productivity. So uh, what we actually saw is that uh, in most, most of the countries, uh, additional nutrients was very, very low uh, to the recommended in East African region, which actually ran between 125 to 250 kilograms per hectare per year for the essential uh, uh, macronutrients. The only country where there are some kind of uh, relatively uh, 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 a good, let's say, uh, input of nutrient is basically Kenya and Rwanda. Uh, but in most countries, uh, the input was just negligible. Though 31 compared to 250 uh, kilograms per hectare. Also sound uh, negligible. Uh, for the estimation of uh, the net productivity, we used uh, uh, the adjusted vegetation index, soil adjusted vegetation index uh, for 2001 to 2019 to determine the status of land productivity. So as we said, we establish the relation between savvy and rainfall, and we made sure that the rainfall effect was, was removed uh, from, uh, from the savvy and then uh, use the survey uh, to generate the different uh, percentiles and uh, uh, compute the different levels of product. So uh, we came up uh, with eight uh, classes and uh, uh, these uh, actually are uh, defined and described uh, in the table we have here. So, Extremely low uh, net productivity for us uh, means these are portion of land that are entirely bare or rocky. And very high, uh, these are portion of land with very high standing biomass, uh, which are close vegetation, close over evergreen or deciduous forest, mosaic vegetation or grassland or shrubland or forest, or sometimes uh, some kind of cropland with uh, forest. So uh, we had a number of assumptions uh, in generating these models. Uh, the first assumption is that uh, vegetation, of course, is very key indicator of land productivity. So if a soil is of very low productivity, then even if, if the condition remain the same, uh, then uh, the biomass should be very low. This, uh, uh, if a soil is very low to low product productivity, then uh, if we see very big biomass, uh, it actually mean we have in front of us, either a forest or a plantation natural regeneration. Uh, so those are the things we, we are looking for. And we, we actually cross-check uh, with our uh, uh, estimates. Then for soil of medium productivity, uh, to have high to very high biomass, uh, that means generally there is an intervention which was made. And if soil with high productivity uh, we see low to medium uh, productivity, it actually means somehow these particular soils uh, have undergone uh, degradation. So those were 
uh, the major assumption which uh, we are made uh, on uh, our model, uh, the model which was generated. So basically, uh, this uh, uh, give uh, an indication of what was done. Uh, I, I will actually ask the moderator and uh, if there are any questions, uh, um, we are ready to, to answer them. Uh, otherwise, uh, I would like to say thank you for listening, listening to us uh, and uh, we are on standby uh, for any clarification or comment or any other question. Uh, thank you very much. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, uh, for taking us through that introductory part of the land productivity and uh, assessment and, met 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 and methodology. It, it, it is a highly scientific, it says it was a highly scientific but elaborate presentation. Uh, participants, you'll agree with me that he was down on earth. He took time to make sure that everybody moves with him. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, going by what the team leader, uh, GMA, GMEA South Africa, RCM already said, that this training is two way. It is sharing and learning. So now I want to invite, uh, if there are any questions, if there, anything to sh there is anything to share from you, dear participants, or from any, any person logged in, so please raise your hand if you can. Uh, and, and if you cannot, you still can chat. You can put it in the chat. Professor is, 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 is or, you know, he's looking at the chat and anything that comes through, you'll be able to address it. But I'm requesting that we, uh, maybe we pick five at a time. Prof, Yes, guide no us. problem. Yeah, no. let's pick, yeah, let's pick five at a time. Uh, and then, uh, and then we do what? And then we, uh, Professor will address them accordingly. Yes, um, I can see Brian. Brian, please unmute and 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 and, and submit. Okay, yes, thank Brian. you. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Uh, thank you, Prof, for the uh, really a nice and interesting presentation. So a quick one. Uh, I wanted you to comment on the uh, inputs. Uh, don't you think uh, that the inputs are affected by the current nutrient content that these countries have and uh, that some countries feel that their soils have low nutrients that actually their input is very high uh, compared to the others that feel maybe their nutrients are considerable enough for uh, the productivity that they want for that particular period. Uh, then um, do you think these inputs can end up leading to loss of fertility. Okay. Okay, maybe, Chair, can I maybe uh, react on what uh, Brian, the question of Brian? Yeah, Madonna. there is another one in the chat, Prof. I've seen, I've seen, yeah. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. You can address those ones in the meantime. Yeah. Yes, let me address those, those ones. Okay, I think Mekonen, uh, from Ethiopia can be assured he will get uh, the PowerPoint uh, because he was asking for uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, then Fabien uh, is asking what uh, can we say about the impact of climate change issues vis-a-vis -vis the soil fertility and, uh, and productivity. Uh, uh, what we can, of course, climate change Climate being part of uh, the factors influencing uh, productivity, we expect it's anticipated that uh, any change in climate parameters will certainly have uh, an effect on uh, productivity. Uh, some cases, it will be negative depending on the, uh, the way uh, the climate parameters, uh, uh, the trend of climate parameters, but in some other cases may be positive uh, as many models, uh, climate models and suitability studies have shown. Uh, uh, and this productivity, of, of course, will vary from one crop to another. 
because that's another thing someone has to bear in mind. Uh, a soil can be less productive for coffee, but it may be good, uh, uh, very highly productive for maize because productivity may also be crop specific. So uh, as uh, the climate parameter vary, they may favor certain crop and actually be, uh, have negative effects on other crops based on the requirement of each of them. Now, uh, uh, to go, going back to the question of Brian, uh, uh, I also, we also suspected that, of course, uh, region uh, countries which feel like uh, their soils are uh, relatively uh, exhausted, uh, they may want to uh, actually put more. I think that's the case of Kenya and probably the case of Rwanda because of uh, uh, a number of issues, as you said, uh, the need uh, to increase productivity based on the use of the land. But uh, in, other, in, other, in other countries, including Uganda, for example, where I think Brian is coming from, uh, there are many people uh, who are actually challenged with their soils but they don't have resources to actually buy the fertilizer uh, and put. Uh, and sometimes uh, they may even not know uh, what type of fertilizer they may have to put. And other cases may actually be that some of these people have negative perception of fertilizer because they have used either adulterated or uh, fertilizer which are not adequate to the crop or use it, misuse it, uh, and uh, uh, they didn't get an adequate response of uh, fertilization. But uh, it may be true for some, some countries as, as uh, uh, Brian said. So uh, I'm, I'm still there to wait for any other, uh, any other question. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof, for addressing those two. And uh, for your information, dear participants, our uh, professor's presentation has been recorded and will be shared with you. Or even others that would, uh, that would, that would like to, to get it, we shall provide a link to it and uh, that will be available. So can we take up another set of questions? Yes, uh, Chair, uh, I've got uh, uh, two more questions. Actually, yes. three, three more questions. Let me answer them. Okay. Uh, Okao, uh, Patricia. Okay. She said, what assumption did you use for the effect of temperature to the fertility? Uh, I didn't see it anywhere. Uh, yeah, uh, she, she uh, uh, thank you very much, Patricia. Of course, it didn't turn out to be in, uh, in the model, but uh, temperature is a part of uh, evapotranspiration. And we know that uh, the more biomass, the more evapotranspiration. So uh, uh, in one way or the other, uh, temperature is already taken care of in, uh, in the biomass. There's another question is uh, from Twizer, and the question read, uh, I have a question about fertility and productivity. You have said more, uh, okay, indicators. What about the soil erosion for reliability, mitigation, and rehabilitation? I think this natural fertilizer can help the people. Okay, I, I think uh, probably what you want to say is that uh, if we manage to, to enhance, uh, to control erodibility, meaning uh, actually adding more uh, organic matter, uh, and then we have uh, relatively very good bounds between particles, then we control erosion, and that could be uh, one way or the other of uh, improving uh, productivity. Uh, if that's uh, the question, the way the question uh, reads, then I agree with you that uh, investment towards uh, carbon sequestration and carbon capitalization in the soil 
is very, very important in improving fertility. And especially the fact due to the fact that carbon uh, and uh, soil organic matter is basically a very big uh, reservoir for most of the nutrients. So uh, improving carbon content is very, very important uh, in improving um, uh, fertility and productivity of the soil. Now, uh, the other question is uh, from uh, Samuel, a quarry, and he said, you cited land use practices as also a contributing factor to soil reproductivity, but from my side, it's a, a broader factor. Probably there is need to cite which kind of land use practices contribute highest to loss addition and soil of soil productivity. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Samuel, uh, is fine. You may you may actually be right to some extent, but we are looking at uh, in this case here uh, the above ground productivity. Uh, if if someone look at uh, uh, if you put two land uses, except uh, example, you put a cultivated land. Uh, with uh, purely uh, maize, and on the other side, you put on the same soil, you put uh, trees, uh, any type of trees, but which can grow uh, very fast, and you get your uh, earth observation tool. Of course, you will see that uh, where you planted trees, uh, you seem to be having uh, more above ground productivity. Uh, and that's what we are talking about. In this case here, we are not looking at the soil productivity, and that's why you need to, as we discussed in, uh, in our assumptions, uh, the way we, uh, we, we see, we interpret values of uh, uh, productivity, of net productivity, uh, to infer uh, soil productivity. Uh, so that's, that's uh, very, very important for someone to, to understand before uh, you go into interpretation of the values. Uh, uh, so another question is from Anthony uh, Kagaro. He said, can you comment on productivity of rangeland as an ecosystem? What challenges are related to this particular ecosystem? Yeah, uh, rangeland are very special ecosystems, especially uh, uh, because of uh, 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 the uh, dropout from the from the animals, which actually contribute to uh, building uh, uh, some good of carbon and soil carbon uh, or soil organic matter in the soil, uh, and but uh, the the biggest challenge, of course, of rangeland these days is uh, that uh, uh, most cases uh, try to reduce as much as possible uh, the trees and, uh, and the shrubs. And, and basically, uh, try to look at uh, what uh, is palatable for, for the animals. So by so doing, of course, one or the other, you build on one side the soil organic matter, and the argument will be, oh yeah, but uh, soil, it, it is easy actually to store more in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the soil. But the biggest challenge for rangeland is that most of these uh, ecosystems are located on very fragile uh, uh, landscape with very shallow uh, uh, soils. And then two animals, uh, when they make a lot of compaction, uh, then whatever drop uh, goes on it, is likely to be uh, eroded with the next uh, uh, rain. So uh, uh, here, uh, these rangeland need uh, a lot of attention, and I think uh, people uh, need to, uh, if we really need to build uh, biomass on them, uh, uh, there is need somehow the other, some, one or the other, to integrate uh, some leguminous trees. Um, or other trees which can actually provide uh, more shade and improve uh, the overall uh, uh, above ground productivity. 
Then uh, Kobusinge asked, what about the effect of pests and disease on productivity? As I said, uh, of course, uh, pests and diseases are very, very key in, in, uh, in determining uh, productivity. Uh, but uh, uh, during this study, we couldn't separate uh, the effect of, uh, of pests and diseases uh, in the data we, we, we have. And uh, 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 generating some of this information with incidents uh, uh, was uh, uh, incidents of disease and pests was uh, a bit uh, uh, complicated. But uh, um, if uh, anyone has an idea on how uh, to do it, uh, that will be uh, welcomed. Then we have Bizimana. Uh, Bizimana ask, uh, uh, most of the data is at global scale. Uh, uh, this can hide a lot of details, uh, especially in varying landscape and whatever. Uh, in countries like Rwanda. Uh, so is it possible to emphasize on using local data to improve the accuracy of the model? Uh, Bizimanga is, Bizimana is completely right. Uh, we need uh, 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 high resolution information. Uh, the good thing that the model which generates accommodate all type of uh, images. So if you have Iconos, you have Obview, you have uh, Landsat, uh, or you have Sentinel, uh, all these will be accommodated by the model. So it's up to you now, if you want to improve uh, what you have uh, in Rwanda, there is no problem. The model is already built and uh, uh, you can just test it on the, on the, on the, on the model, uh, on the data you have. Uh, uh, Singh Juris uh, still ask how was the model validated? Uh, yes, the model was validated using, uh, as I said, for productivity, we actually use uh, the FAO uh, inherent potential for soil and uh, for uh, above ground, we use the proxy approach uh, where one part of the data was used for generating the model and the second part was used for validation. Um, then uh, we, this, uh, he said, uh, it will be more accurate if uh, we also put in the nutrient deposition, wet and dry, the position uh, very well, uh, well right uh, with the, but we we this, but the issue here again uh, is uh, to get the information about uh, weight and dry deposition. This is very very important because uh, nutrient loading through the atmospheric deposition is very very important, especially for areas uh, near the water bodies. Um, and the forest. Uh, as I said, uh, we couldn't uh, get data on uh, dry deposition. The few uh, stations uh, which have used, uh, which are generated uh, some uh, uh, wet depositions, I think uh, was uh, during La Vin, La Vin one for uh, the Lake Victoria catchment. And that was in 2000, Two, if I have good memory, uh, with uh, 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 Mr. Wejuli at that time. Uh, most of the studies on weight depositions are done uh, basically in, uh, in uh, the south. Uh, I think Bootsman and Heki have done a very, very, very good, very good work uh, in, in those catchment. But uh, 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 in the area where we are, uh, uh, very, very few studies have been conducted. Uh, so, uh, and that's why uh, uh, we didn't use them in, uh, in the model. Uh, yeah, so uh, I need to also add uh, one thing that uh, 
In the validation process, of course, the model is shared with uh, the member countries and colleagues in the member countries also uh, uh, assisted to validate the output of the model. Okay, so uh, uh, Bizima and Jean Pierre, uh, you will get the presentation. Uh, we also appreciate your appreciation of uh, our presentation. So if there is any additional question, uh, I'm still uh, ready to, to provide uh, any insight uh, if there is. Hello. Is everything okay? All is well, dear participants. Yeah, the presentation was very, very interesting. We appreciate too much. Well, thank you, Jean Pierre. Oh, th thank, thank you, you. Margaret. How are you? <laughs> fine, thank you. How are you? Mm, that's I'm fine. Mm. So I don't know whether prof uh we can do anything no... in this remaining 30 minutes or I yeah so uh, yes now uh i was uh, suggesting that uh, uh we take them through or we give them give an assignment for uh people to to do at home just to get a feel of what uh, this uh, making an estimation of the soil productivity index. Um, then tomorrow, we could also do the same uh, to show uh, uh, maybe tomorrow after tomorrow, I think it's a program of after tomorrow, we should be able to actually show how uh, it was done to uh, make an estimate of uh, the above ground productivity. So uh, I think the, uh, there is a link uh, showing the data which was uh, used. Uh, and uh, there is also a link to, to the manual. Uh, which was used, generated to actually estimate uh, productivity. I, I just wanted to uh, to share some of this data and uh, and, and show uh, how this was done in a, in a few minutes, and then we will allow people to also uh, uh, do it. Are there is? Yeah, you're welcome, Professor. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So they have a, an Excel sheet called Soil Target Region. Soil Target Region. So uh, I want to get to that data set. So this soil target region has, uh, let me remove the filter. Prof, can I direct them where it is? Yeah, please. Yeah, dear participants, this was posted on your emails. Kindly check your emails. This is where this data, the file is, sorry. So please yeah. check it and yeah. go, 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 go by the instructions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. So, uh, if you look at, uh, if you manage to open it, this is basically uh, uh, the sheet or the table, which is uh, on the soil map of uh, uh, the data which is going to be used uh, for soil productivity estimation. And here we, we, we just want to, to demonstrate how uh, this uh, was done in Excel 
what, what how it done it done in Excel, and then how uh, 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 the software or the tool which is which was generated in QGIS basically uh, perform. Uh, what are the, uh, uh, the logic in the calculation? So uh, you, you will actually see uh, in this Excel sheet, so you have the, uh, uh, the name of the country. We, you have the FAO soil uh, classification, uh, the code. Uh, you have the code of the country. Um, and then you have the area for that unit. I've, I've removed uh, for uh, specific reason, I've removed uh, the water bodies where uh, we never had properties, just to make sure that uh, you do at ease the calculation. Then uh, you realize that this uh, Excel has sand, it has silt, and it has clay. So those three elements give you the soil texture. So we have already provided the soil texture, but uh, if, if you want to know how that one is done, we can share with you uh, the Taylor uh, 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 Triangle, or we can actually share with you uh, the soil and water conservation tool, which assists you to define uh, which texture class you have uh, based on the, uh, the three uh, particle size. Then you have pH, uh, and then you have another pH. You see uh, pH water and pH water S. The pH water S is for the subsoil. And then you have uh, pH water, should have been pH water T or topsoil, uh, to mean for the topsoil. So you have, for each of these parameters, organic carbon, you have the organic carbon for top and subsoil. The nitrogen you have for top and subsoil. Uh, you have base saturation for top and subsoil. So every parameter you have here, there is top and subsoil for all of them. Okay, so then uh, we also added the name of uh, the unit based on the FAO classification. And then we also added uh, the productivity of that unit based on the FAO classification. Okay. And then you have the depth of the soil. Now, so this is the data set you are supposed to use. Now, I want also to, uh, to share with you uh, just uh, moving uh, through it, the estimation of soil productivity in Excel and in the, in the software. So I'm going to share with you uh, this one. Let me stop sharing this, the Excel, and share uh, the estimation. So uh, basically, as you see, uh, as we put as a learning outcome, is for people to use the concept of factor rating. For, for those who have been, uh, have used uh, uh, suitability assessment, uh, certainly will not, uh, they will understand easily uh, uh, this approach. Uh, 
but the aim is basically to have an idea of how uh, the model has been, uh, what is behind the model anyway. So we have put just as uh, for, for you to, to exercise uh, five parameters out of the seven. And uh, we also put the way uh, you are supposed to do it. Uh, for example, if, if the idea is uh, you want to, uh, to use CEC as a parameter, uh, the first thing, because we want you to, to do it for your country, so it is important that you filter among all the countries, filter your country. Once you filter your country, the next thing is how do we apply uh, the factor rating? And then for you to apply the factor rating, you need to create a column for the factor rating CEC. And then use the formula if, which uh, is provided in uh, the PowerPoint. So this formula actually take into consideration the different uh, factor rating uh, we have. For example, here for CEC, we are saying low means less than five. And that's what, for example, if your sale is, uh, uh, the new sale is AP you have created. So you, are, uh, you call it A. A meaning uh, the factor rating for CEC, cation exchange capacity. Then on AP2, so AP1 will be A, AP2 will be the first sale where the formula has to be put. So you will copy this formula. You can actually copy it the way it is and change the location uh, of uh, based on the location of the CEC. So once you have copied it and you say enter, it will give you, it will tell you if it is low or if it is uh, moderate or if it is high or if it is very high. And then you copy that formula for the entire uh, uh, Excel, the entire column. You go to the next, for organic matter, you do the same. You go to the next, you do the same until you have the five uh, done. And then you can combine them. You can combine them by using the formula, which is there of LPI, which is equal to 100 times the square root of the product of the different factor rating you will get. So the number of zeros you are going to divide with should be two times the number of factors you have used. If you have five factor, then you should divide by 10 power 10. If you have seven factor, you should divide by 10 power, uh, uh, 10 powers, uh, no, uh, 10 power 14, okay? So once that one is done, then you can now do the same way we did, use the same formula if by uh, using uh, uh, these values, the range we have provided to get uh, the last uh, class for your classification. So we say very low, less than 30, low between 30 and 50, uh, moderate between 50 and 70, high between 70 and 85, and uh, uh, very high above 85. So once that one is done, then you answer for us these questions. You compare the inherent productivity, which we have provided for you in the column AN, 
with what we have computed. And we will want you to estimate the percent area covered by each LPI. So once you have your LPI, we want us, we want you to suggest some strategies to enhance agricultural production in your country. So that's what uh, we would want you to do uh, uh, today. And uh, tomorrow, we will take some 10 minutes, 10, 10 to 30 minutes to go through it together uh, for those who will fail to, to do it. But uh, uh, since uh, they have created a link, uh, if you have any question, don't hesitate. Even if it is midnight, uh, send a message. I should be able to, to guide you. Uh, if there is any question, please, uh, you are free to ask it. Question, sir. Yeah, go ahead, please. The assignment will be submitted. Uh, uh, not necessary, but it's good that you have it so that you can compare with what you do. It's good for learning. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much, Pro. Yes, yes, Chair. For opening doors for more questions. Dear participants, we you can you can put or in case of any issues or questions, please don't hesitate to to to, to punch them in the classroom, Google Classroom. Our prof is already there, and the other facilitators will also be able to address them. Uh, a lot of questions are coming up, request, requesting for the presentation, the slides and the recording. Yes, the recording, the link to the recording will be shared with you. And then the, the PowerPoint presentation for Prof will also be shared as soon as possible. Um, requesting that we take up this assignment, dear participants. Let's take it up and uh, come back with the results tomorrow. And we compare and we see, and uh, you know, we learn. This is a way of, of, of proving that, yes, I think I've learned. Yes, I think I can do this one for my country. Yeah, and even for my whatever institution or whatever it may be. Um, yes, we, we have evaluation forms that will be filled in. Feel free to, uh, to evaluate us and uh, help us improve where we can. Um, a prof has promised to be with us in the morning. I mean, sorry, on uh, in the tomorrow at the beginning of the live session. So kindly uh, participants, please take up the assignment, come with questions, come with concerns, uh, where it hasn't worked and how it has not worked. He will be able to address them. Um, is there anything that we need to to yes, address, chair. yes. There are some uh, some questions I, I want to address them. Uh, one is coming from uh, Mohammed Abegaz. He said controls of cation exchange capacity increase during the composting process. Does the specific surface area play a role? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, for, for, for those who have done soil chemistry, of course, they actually know the, uh, the specific surface area is very, very important, especially in uh, those interactions. Um, uh, the other one is uh, Ahmed. Yeah, Emmanuel, uh, I think, uh, thank you very much, Emmanuel, uh, for the compliment and other people who have actually uh, complimented us. Um, for Kalumba, uh, what depths were the sample taken? Uh, so uh, Kalumba, this is not our data, this is the global data. Um, you can get it from FAO, but uh, generally the top soil is zero to 15 centimeters and the subsoils is uh, between 15 and 30 uh, centimeters. Um, 
Polycap, uh, uh, yes, we will share, we will share uh, this. Uh, thank you, Fabien, uh, for your compliment. Um, uh, thank you, Mugeni, for your compliment also. Um, uh, Irene, uh, don't worry, uh, things will be shared, uh, including the assignment.